Welcome to our November technical meeting. Um, Dalton and I are down in Richfield in Carrie Lynn's office. Um, and then uh, I think Wade's in, Wade's in Clearfield, Brad's in Salt Lake, but uh, both of them will be chiming in at some point during the meeting. Um, on the screen right now, can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Yep. All right. Yeah. Just got the agenda. I, as we always do, I got a couple of training opportunities. Our new business, which is usually our production. I got something quick we want to talk about about the rate on consent uh, form. Just kind of a reminder and a clarification. Uh, a reminder about the uh, new BWR boxes. They were required as of November first. And then our next technical meeting will be the first Tuesday in December, which is the fourth. And then for the meat of our meeting, Brad's got some stuff he's going to talk about. He's got an awards program uh, that he needs to uh, tell us all about uh, so that we can do stuff in the right, along the right timeline. And then uh, the main topic is we had just some questions from the field that we wanted to, we thought it was timely to talk about uh, static pressure. So Wade will be teaching us a little bit about it. Dalton will be reviewing the field guide stuff about it. And then I'll speak for a moment about uh, using static pressure in the audit. So that's kind of what we're going to go through during the meeting today. Does anybody have any questions or anything pressing that we need to address as part of this agenda or as part of this meeting? All right, I'm hearing nothing, so I'm going to get started. So I just have two training opportunities listed. One of them is that that's been here for the last few months. I am going to be doing a, uh, a NEAT MIA or Audit 101 in April. And that is the intent of that is will be a larger group for Q people who need to learn how to run the audit so that they can get their QCI certification. So, so that that is coming. Um, just throw that up there. Make sure it's on your schedule. I have not sent out like a sign up form for any like that yet because it's still a few months out. But the reason that I cover that is I am teaching that same class at the end of this month because we have two new auditors in the program. Um, that class has to remain small, but if there's anybody out there who needs that class uh, specifically to be an auditor, I could make one more seat available. Uh, so if you need that class, please talk with your coordinator and get in touch with me today. Um, but, but again, I, I am, need to keep that class small so that we have time to, to really get into detail with a couple of the new guys. So uh, is anybody aware of any other training opportunities that are out there that the group could benefit from? All right, and again, if you do come across them, send them my way or send them Wade's way, and we'll kind of share them with the whole group. So, um, so for the production, I think I got a slide here. Um, so, the, just the same charts that I show each each month. This first chart here is our weatherization completions. On the left-hand side, sorry. On the left-hand side, we have uh, our completions per month, and the light green. And that's just the sum total of every agency's monthly goals. So each agency had a goal of to four or five or eight or ten units. We add them all up, and you know, combined, the, the light green represents that goal for the month. And as you can see, in the month of October, our combined goal was to get 50 units, and we got 58. So we exceeded the goal, which is fantastic. Uh, over on the right, the light green is just the running total. So we take the, the goal of 34 in July, and then we add the next months and so on, so that by the end of the year, we've completed as many units as we need to. Um, but as you can see, even though we did surpass our goal this month, we are still a little bit short of where we should be for the year. Uh, we're at 146 units, and we should be at 168. So we're 
22 units shy of where we need to be. Uh, I went through and looked to see which agencies were right where they need to be as of the end of October. And there's one agency that has completed the number of units that they had set goals to have completed by the end of October. And that's five county. So I wanted to just thank you guys for all your hard work and your efforts there. Um, and thank, thanks to everybody for all that you've done. I like there, there's definitely a little uptick in production. I know everybody's working hard. Um, please continue. We're still a little short uh, from where we're at. It means we've all got a couple of units to make up. So just meeting your, your goal for the month is not quite going to cut it. We're going to have to somehow squeeze in an extra unit uh, here and there to meet our goal. So any questions on weatherization production? Uh, this next screen is uh, our crisis completions on the left and then just a picture of our the total number of clients we're serving. Um, so for crisis completions, the, the light blue represents the last four years, just an average, the, the average number of crisis completions that we've been dealing with. The dark blue represents this year. And this year we, we have had an uptick, uh, but I think most of that uptick is uh, represented by or is because of the, the new water heaters and the air conditioners that have recently been added to the clients or to the crisis uh, stuff. So we're getting more crisis completions. Um, but so far until this month, we were kind of serving about the same amount of clients. And so again, this on the right here, the light purple represents the average number of clients that we've served. And this is an unduplicated count. So if you serve them with weatherization and with crisis, I only counted them one time. Um, but over the last four years, this just represents the average number of clients we've served each month. And the darker purple represents how many we've served so far this year. Um, so again, we've, we're kind of trending with what we've been doing on average. But in the last month, on average, we normally serve 49. And this last month, we served 63. So there is an uptick there in the actual number of clients we're serving. So we were able to come to turn in more units than our target this month and serve more clients. So, so I, we do recognize that you guys are working. You are working very hard and we appreciate all your efforts. Um, so any questions on the production numbers or concerns or anything? All right. Um, as I've been out in the field the la this last month, I came across uh, two questions or two issues with the radon and the radon consent form. Uh, we've talked about radon quite a bit in the last few meetings. We talked about it in our training in August. Um, as of July 1st, because of the new health and safety rules, we are required to get a signature from our clients. Um, that they have been informed about radon and that they've received a uh, radon citizen's guide to radon. I've been checking at every agency to make sure that they've actually started collecting signatures from clients. Um, and I just ran into two issues that we need to clarify really quickly. Uh, one of them was, I, so I found this form was being used at a couple of agencies. And I, I was told that it came from Salt Lake, uh, from like uh, Utah Community Action. I haven't confirmed that. I love the form um, and like so thank you guys whoever put this together um, there's a couple of issues with it that if we're going to continue to use it we're going to have to tweak it a little bit uh, but I love how concise it is I love that it, it serves as a checklist that you can just go through when you're doing client ed make sure you've covered everything um, but as far as the radon goes it, we would need to add a little bit to it to make it work properly. Um, and this is what I'm talking about. So in the guidance from DOE, uh, they put out weatherization program notice 17-7, which has all the new health and safety guidance in it. And one of the documents that was part of 17-7 was this weatherization 7-7, 17-7 table of issues. 
And in the table of issues, they gave specific guidance about radon. Uh, and what's, I guess what's missing from that form is what's highlighted down here. So, so under radon, under the client ed section, it says, it talks about what specifically has to be included in the informed consent form. It says the informed consent form must include information from the results of the IAQ study. They, they did an IAQ study, and so it's basically saying information from this study that there is a small risk of increased radon levels when building tightness is improved. You must have a list of precautionary weatherization measures that will be installed uh, based on the EPA indoor environmental protocols. You must have some of the benefits of weatherization, including energy savings, energy cost savings, improved home comfort, and increased safety. And you must have, down at the bottom here, a confirmation that the EPA's Citizen Guide to Radon was received by the client. So uh, this form, it does have the, basically if they check the box and you get this client signature, you have the confirmation that They've received the pamphlet, but we're missing these other items here that would need to be included. Um, so if you're using just that form, it doesn't quite meet the standard. Uh, DOE gave us this the, the language for the informed consent form, but as you read that guidance, it doesn't have to include all of these exact words, but again, it has to have info about the IAQ increased risk, which they uh, they included here. I'm aware that you know there's an increased level radon risk. Uh, you have to have precautionary measures, which they listed here. You have to tell about the benefits, which they listed in this paragraph. That there's cost savings and improved comfort and blah blah blah. And then and then also you have to have that. I have received the environmental citizens guide to radon thing. So uh, anyway, I, that stuff's missing from that. So if you're using that, this form as a standalone, uh, we need to do a modification to it or uh, we need to shift over and use this form. The other thing that I noticed on this form, which I'm, is a little bit of a concern, um, I, I like this form because it deals with some of the, the issues that you guys have to deal with out in the field. Uh, you've got a way, it says that, you know, I certify that I attempted to deliver the following information. And then further down on this form, it also has a way that you can uh, receive or you can document that you just got certified mail. Whoops. That bar. But um, in the case of radon, I don't, we cannot self-certify that we've delivered the radon. And, and the reason why is this other question that came up. So... Um, I went to one agency and they were collecting the signature for radon after the work was done. And so we had to talk about why that doesn't work. And it, it is because of this right here. So in this 17-7, they also said that clients must sign an informed consent form prior to receiving weatherization services. So the appropriate time to collect the signature is before you start weatherization. So you either need to get the signature during your application process or your auditor could collect the signature. But the auditor needs to collect the signature before weatherization services. So if you don't have a signature, they cannot receive weatherization services. So if you're an auditor, don't waste a bunch of time auditing the house if you haven't collected this signature from the client. And also, as I read this, clients must sign an informed consent form. So the way I'm reading that, us self-certifying that we tried to deliver the informed consent form to the client, but they weren't available, doesn't quite cut that one. So, um, so if, uh, if on this form, this, this wouldn't really work here. And then same thing with the certified mail. The certified mail, you're getting a document saying that they received a document, but what DOE is asking us to do is actually have the client sign 
this document saying, I'm aware of these things, I have received this pamphlet, and I'm willing to take upon these risks. So does anybody have any questions on that? I just want to note that that was made for from the lead form. That's why the self-certifies on there. And our intention was never to use this for the new radon. Oh, and thanks, Ian. I, you actually have a thing on there that uh, it says specifically about lead, too, which is not showing up on my screen. And again, um, I love the form. And, and whoever put it together, one of the things I noticed was this information I just went through wasn't really available to you guys. Like, I did not put this in the guidelines. I did put this sentence in the guidelines, but I didn't put all this information in there. So it, it, it's, I kind of feel like it's m my responsibility because I didn't give you guys all the information you needed about it, and I love that you guys uh, were making a tool that would work well in the real world. So, um, so well, thank you for that. we've been using for like six years. Yeah. And, and as I thought about the other, the other ways that, it applies. I think it works really, really well. I think we just want to get rid of the radon part of it so that there's no confusion. But I think it works for everything else, doesn't it? But anyway, yeah. I, I like it. Like, And if we could figure out how to squeeze the radon into this form, I, I think that would be fantastic. Unfortunately, it's just going to require a bunch more words to go onto a form. But anyway. Um, if you're not following the, if you're not collecting the signatures and the, using the radon consent forms, start today. Um, well, I've got a question assessment. about this, though. Yeah, do ahead. we really need to review the form, or can we just add the radon consent form? Because we did radon yeah. education because it was information that we were providing before we were you know, required to do so. Oh, I got you. Yeah, absolutely. You could you could have this plus this if you wanted to. That would that would be fine. Because because this meets the standard, so you don't necessarily have to modify your form. And but and again, any of the agencies out there, if you're you know if you're using something like this but doesn't quite meet the standard, just this copy of the radon consent form. I just put it together really quickly and put it on our website so that if you guys want, you can use this form. But what DOE said was. You can, and, and I've kind of thrown that out to the group, you can, you can make your own form, just make sure if you're doing it that it includes really, and it doesn't even have to be all of these exact words, but it's got to cover all of this stuff that's in the program notice 17-7, so, which if you use all hey, Matt? Words, it does it. Yeah. Go ahead. Hey, um, does it have to be signed by the by the actual client, or can it be signed by like one of the kids, the one that lives at the house that's that's of age? Um, it really should be signed by the client, but you ask a good question because again, in the real world, how do we practically apply all this stuff? Um, I don't know. Yeah, because the the actual client, um, she does that. Uh, um, what do you call that medical transportation? She works out in Salt Lake. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to catch her. Yeah, and if if you're having a lot of struggles with that kind of stuff, I know it's this this one in my mind. It would be so. I would if I was doing this, I would do it. I'd have the auditor do it because then the auditor is in front of the client and talk to them about it if they have concerns. But if you're having a lot of trouble with it, you know, maybe include it in your application because that's when the client's sitting down and, you know, signing other things as well. But I don't know. Does anybody else have any advice on this one? But it really should be the client because... And yeah, uh, so Dalton just asked, you are, you are supposed to defer. So my reading of this one right here, clients must sign an informed consent form prior to receiving weatherization services. In my mind, answers that question. Yes, if you don't have that signature, you need to defer. So <clears throat> anyway, anything else on radon before I move on? All right, but yeah, please make sure that you're 
this is in your process and you're following it. Um, we talked about this in at great length last time. So just a quick reminder, as of a couple of days ago, you're now required to fill out the new fields on the BWRs. As we review them this month, if these fields are not filled out, we'll be calling you or we'll be rejecting the BWR that you submit. Um, I don't remember if we covered it or not, but this, this field, the actual MMBTUs, you do not need to fill that out. We thought that the number coming from the audit was more meaningful, but it's not. But everything else needs to be filled out. So any questions on that? All right. I'm going to turn the time over to Brad to talk about. Are you able to take control back, Brad, or do I have to give it to you? Oh, probably. Anyway, Brad's going to talk about uh, our awards program. So. All right. All right. Um, those of you that were at the uh, winter training last year, the pictures from it, it was Mike. And for those of you who remember, uh, first one of the first coordinators of the program handing out our our new award we created last year, our Innovation Award. Um, I, I kind of made a joke about expanding that last year because I was teasing one of the members that was present. But um, in that time, I, I put a little thought and some research into it. And uh, what we ended up deciding to do is expand this and actually make it a formal award policy. Um, the reason we put it in writing is because then it complies with some provisions in 2 CFR 200, which allows us to do certain things that I wanted to do if we're going to expand this. Um, so we created four different award categories, the innovation award we'd already had going, service awards, something we've kind of been doing off and on. I wanted to formalize that as well, and then the two new awards that we created. Um, so with uh, the Mike Johnson Award, like I said, this was something I talked about. It's it's not a participation trophy or anything like that. It's it's uh, it's for those overachievers, and uh, you know, it's it's not something that we expect to, we'll get awarded every year. Um, that standard is meant and will be kept at a high level. Um, the new award we created was an agency award. Uh, for those of you that knew Gary, um, he had just short of 31 years in the program. Uh, he had a lot of time out in the field, and I got to know him not only as a coworker but as friend, but he had a lot of amazing stories about some of the crazy things he saw over the years out there in the field. And so we decided uh, to come up with an award that you as agencies uh, will compete against each other for. Um, and, and the real idea behind this is that you submit a photo and that one photo says it all. Uh, there might be a need for a short, maybe a couple of lines of, of narrative for context, but the idea is that, that the, the, the image says it all. Uh, just uh, some of those things that came to mind over the year when I was talking to some other people about this is uh, there was one agency one year that when they went up in the attic, they found the entire attic full of pine cones, for example. Uh, just there's there's been some strange things that you guys see, and uh, we want to take a you know a little bit of time to recognize uh, you know the agencies and and the unusual conditions they get to work in to do this job. Um, that bold section, I I cannot reiterate. We do not want this to end badly, um, so we want to make sure that uh, any of these things we, we're not identifying where, you know, the client home or we don't want to come off as being disrespectful or disparaging to those people that are in poverty or low income. So you need to be mindful about um, just exactly how you are taking and presenting these photos to us. Um, but the, the thing is, it, at the end of the day, there will be a winner and a runner-up selected. Uh, there's there's different levels of, of how much you get to spend, but the entire agency will be able to uh, bill out a lunch um, to the program for uh, in recognition of that. And we will be creating a a very custom, unique trophy that it will be in keeping with the provisions and name of this award. Um, the other award is 
uh, for health and safety. This is going to be an individual award. Um, each agency will only be able to nominate one individual. So internally, your agencies where you may identify more than one uh, situation or scenario, you're going to have to come up with some kind of a mechanism uh, to determine which out of your agency is the most deserving and forward that one to us for the evaluation. Um, there are just some basic criteria in there to create uh, some differ differentiators if we have to make a decision between what would appear to be two equal awards. Um, if, if there's a nomination that has, you know, good documentation, photos and things like that, we'd obviously want to pick that over. Um, and then the second discriminator would be uh, given that two jobs were wholly equal, um, if, if uh, there was a higher potential for saving of lives on that. Um, and then, like I said, we got a little bit of admin leave for that individual in the runner-up. Um, another, you know, great example, I think one of the first stories I heard, those of you that might know or remember a gentleman by the name of Steve Fox that worked as an auditor in housing authority years before he came to the state. Um, he went in one time to a house, found the water heater flew, completely detached. The, the occupant, the only reason she was probably still alive was because she was on oxygen, but the the water heater was putting off like 450 parts per million or some crazy thing like that, then completely into the house. Probably part of the reason why the client was on oxygen to begin with. So uh, we know these are types of things that you find on a regular basis out there. Uh, likewise, again, we want to recognize um, those efforts that are taking place out there. Uh, the service awards, something we've been doing for years, like I said, um, just kind of formalizing that. So again, it'll be on five-year increments uh, that you'll be recognized. Uh, we're going to start using the uh, training pools as the cutoff for those awards. Um, and then while we fully intend to continue to provide mementos and things, uh, we have to put that caveat in there, that, uh, the budget. You know, we're not going to, uh, you know, if there was ever a lean budget here for some reason, we're, we're going to not put a bunch of money into things when we can't afford it. So. Uh, why I don't ever foresee that provision being, you know, kicked in. You always got to plan for, for the worst when you write things like this. So uh, those are some of the things. The policy is posted out there now officially on the uh, Training Center website. It contains a lot more detail than these slides I just gave you. It actually covers the submission requirements, the submission deadlines. Uh, so uh, what is very important and to understand, so there's a provision like mentioned in 2 CFR 200 that allows us to do things like this. One of the most important things in that provision is it says that work cannot, that was done prior to the implementation of the policy cannot be used in the process. So there is an effective date on the policy the effective date is the 17th of October. That's when I wrote it, and I reviewed it with my staff. We're notifying you about it now. So in this year's uh, submissions, we need to make sure that any of the work you're submitting on is done after the 17th of October of this year, please. Uh, that way it keeps us on the right side of the law. Uh, we, want, we want to be able to recognize and, and you know, it's, it's I, there's times we wish we could do more, but at least buying you guys lunch or uh, giving you a little bit of time off, it's, uh, you know, at this point, it's something we can do, and that's what we're going to do, and we just want to make sure we can continue to do it so we won't stay on the right side of the rules. Uh, that's uh, what I've got. I don't know if anybody has any comments on that or anything, but uh, here you go. And the pictures, too. Say it again? Who would we send the pictures to? That's in the policy, but all submissions will come to me. So yeah, I will I will receive the commission uh, just summary. So I'll receive all the submissions from everybody. I will uh, make them anonymous or whatever. I'll sign a tracking an identifier, you know, just something like an A, B, or C. Then there's a certain committees that will be designated to evaluate these, depending on what the award is. And that way, the committee of reviewing it, it's relatively anonymous. 
There's some instructions in there about making sure in your pictures that there should be nothing there that identifies your agency. If it is, I'm going to have to do something to obscure it, and that could uh, run your chances. So, want to want to try to keep it as, as you know fair and level as possible. Hey, Thanks. Brad. Yeah. Will the Gary Award be in the shape of Gary with the long hair and the cat? No, no. Uh, you're going to just have to wait to see it. I. Wade and I have been scheming and pondering this, and, and uh, we've got a pretty good plan. I, I think when you see the award, it's a, it's a trophy you will get to take home, but it's a trophy you will need to bring back every year. And you're all going to want it because it's going to yeah. be awesome. Um, but uh, we, we want to make sure, you know, it's, it's going to – the trophy will have a, a plaque that will put, you know, your, your agency's name and the year you want it. Um, so it will be perpetual. But at the same time, it's something that you'll have to hand off from year to year. But, uh, and, and we think it, Wade and I are pretty confident that when, when you see the trophy, you'll, you'll, you'll feel that it goes with the award. So thanks, Brandon. Yeah. All right, again, who's next up on the presenter list there, Matt? Wade's next up on the presenter list. Oh, Wade. You up, waiter? Uh, I guess so. If you want right. to. Uh, you you got the controls, Batman. I got the controls? Yeah. Let's see. Let's see if I can make this thing work. <clears throat> well. Can everybody see the static pressure picture that's on my screen? Yep. Yes. 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 Yep. Okay. I was sent an email with a question about static pressure. Um, the email was a little bit vague. It was just kind of, can we go over how we check static pressure? Well, I'm going to go over the basics real quick. If we want to delve a little deeper, we certainly can. In our program, there are two different types of static pressure that we need to be aware of. I'll start with the HVAC side of it because that's what I do. It's called total static pressure, and it's the sum of C and B. That is the total pressure, both in supply and return, that this blower experiences. And when you're an HVAC technician, that number is very important for several reasons. Number one reason, that determines how this fan works, okay? So we need to know total static pressure to understand what we call fan performance curves. Total static pressure dictates entire airflow in the system. There isn't a furnace manufacturer out there that doesn't have a chart in the instruction book that I know you all read that says at X amount of static pressure, this blower will deliver a certain amount of air, okay? So that is the first static pressure that we deal with, total external static pressure. And it's measured at C and B, and it's the sum of those two. We need to know how much resistance the coil is providing on the system. We need to know how much resistance the filter is providing on the system. We need to know how much resistance the ductwork is providing on the system, because at the end of the day, that determines how the fan runs, whether or not the fan will continue to live in that environment, especially if it's an ECM motor, and if we're going to get rated efficiency and rated airflow. Okay. Any questions on total static pressure? <clears throat> I'm Wade. Yeah. I I don't want to take a bunch of people's time, but on the, one of my questions on this is. Uh, in talking with some of the furnace guys, uh, there's a difference if you have um, the air conditioner, if there is a, you know, a coil there that um, when you're doing the static pressure, there's some question as to whether you should be jumping it, you know, to run it or whether you should use the air conditioner on to run it on high to get that static pressure. Exactly, you know, what the situation should be. So if I understand you correctly, your question is, <clears throat> if I have a coil on the furnace, 
And, Correct. And do we have an air conditioner with the coil or no air conditioner? Yes. Okay, so we have a furnace with a coil and air conditioner. You need to run the furnace and check the static in the highest possible speed that the unit will be able to run in. So any system with an air conditioner, when it runs in air conditioning mode, generally speaking, will always run at a higher speed for air conditioning. So if you have a furnace with air conditioning on it, the static pressure, so total static pressure that you want to test, would be with that system running in its highest possible mode that it can run in. So that would be in the cooling mode. Now, the question comes to ask, well, what if it's the middle of December and it's 30 degrees outside and I can't run the compressor because I'll ruin it? Go out and pull the power from the AC unit and turn the thermostat in AC and turn it on and it'll run the fan in its highest speed without turning the condenser on. Okay. That's one trick you can do. There are other tricks. Um, we could probably easily do a class on that if you'd like. You just need to let me know. However, we have to be careful in our training because we don't want to interrupt your guys' production. So we have to be very cognizant of how many training hours we're providing from this point forward. <clears throat> Did that answer your question, Mike? Yeah. Okay. All right. The other thing that we want to talk about is static pressure drops. So like here at C and D, we can determine how much total static pressure this filter is providing on the system. So we simply take these two measurements and they just a subtraction. And you'll find, so like if we have a one inch, and, you, and I think all you guys know this mostly, like a one inch pleated filter creates a very high static pressure drop. So you'll see a higher number here than you would if we had like say four inch thick, thick filter in there. So you can use this static pressure measurement to see what kind of influence your filter is providing on the system or the total static pressure. Okay, so everyone good with that? Is there any questions about that? Okay, if we're all good there, the other points we have are this point and this point where we can measure static pressure that the coil influences on the system. And one thing we need to understand is that a dry coil and a wet coil will have two different static pressure measurements. A dry coil will always have a lower measurement than a wet coil. And what I mean by dry and wet is the coil when you run in air conditioning mode because part of air conditioning is moisture removal this coil will get wet and you know we have that condensate drain where the condensate water runs out of it so the water molecules on the coil actually contribute to a higher static pressure reading so it's something you need to be cognizant of um, most of the HVAC guys know and you can go to any manufacturer and get their coil information and they will tell you their coil at X amount of airflow whether it's dry or wet, will induce this amount of static pressure onto the system. And again, this is just these two measurements, and you subtract, you minus this, this form, which was uh, made by a cap, I do believe, is ab absolutely great. It's really straightforward and, and uh, gives you everything you need to know. So uh, any questions about this measurement, static pressure drop across a, a coil? <clears throat> okay, the other one that came up is apparently, and Turner's mic will probably have to chime in on this, is apparently on the audit, they want the static pressure measured at D and A. Is that correct, Turner? Yeah. Yeah, and it's Why on earth they want it done that way eludes me. I have no answer for that. Um, me and Turner talked about it a little bit. My best guesstimation and his best guesstimation is that because the audit is simply looking at duct leakage, it, it could care less about what this is doing to the motor. It could care less about what this is doing to the motor. It only cares about everything 
on the opposite side of the filter and everything past the A coil to help determine duct leakage. And apparently, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Turner, if you use this static pressure reading on the audit input for your duct sealing, it doubles, triples, or quadruples the amount of money you have available? Or was it the other way around? No, it'll give you a lot of money then. Fill it up the duct. Fill up the duct. Which, I can't even hear what you're saying, Turner. Oh. It will give you lots of money to seal the ducts up if you do it wrong. It'll okay. still give you plenty of money if you do it right, but it'll give you lots and lots of money, like $6,000 more to do it. With the in the shape. audit, it asks for static pressure. It doesn't ask you to do any math. It's just asking you to put your probe in a duct and get mm -hmm. the pressure. Yeah. Okay. And my understanding is that measurement for the audit, according to the conversations Turner had with the guy who developed the audit tool, they want to see that static pressure measurement from point A and point D. Correct? Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a couple other methods on point A, but, but the picture is a good standard. Okay. So kind of to recap, and, and hopefully this answers the question of, from the person who sent me the email, in our program, our complicated program that we run, <clears throat> we have multiple static pressures that we need to be aware of. I, I, I feel the two most important for the audit, obviously, are D and A, because that's what the audit says we need to do, the guy who wrote the program to get our money in there so we can do our duct sealing and repair our duct works. But all the HVAC guys know that the important measurement is C and B because that determines how this guy runs. That determines if this gets rated airflow. That determines if that 13 sear air conditioner is actually a 13 sear because if this is too high, you're not getting 13 sear out of that air conditioner. So again, the two different points are total static, C and B, which is the sum of those numbers. And then for the audit, D and A, which as Ian mentioned, it's just numbers you plug into the audit in order to get money. If you plug these numbers in, apparently you'll get lots of extra money. Questions, comments, or concerns? Hey, Wade, we still have a couple questions about how to specifically test um, okay. on, like, a heat-only system. And I'm getting some feedback here, so... Okay, so what is your specific okay. question on a heat-only system? So since the highest fan speed it will run is when it's on heat, do we mm -hmm. test it with, when it's on heat only, or should we jump red to green to test the static pressure? So if the highest fan speed that it will only run on is on heating, then test your static pressure on that. Um, you can't predict the future. If, if there's no air conditioning on it currently, you're only worried about what exists at the time you're there. Mm -hmm. well, no, I mean, Someone so well, what if five, what if five years down the road the client decides to add air conditioning? and the ductwork won't handle it. That's not your problem. That's the problem for the guy installing the AC. Okay. So if you have just a furnace with no air conditioning and the highest possible speed it will go into is its highest heating speed, that's where you want to test your static pressure. Is that the highest, highest speed it could potentially run at? Okay, so we will never jump red to green for testing static pressure then? There's no reason to if there's no air conditioning on it. If you want to do that because it makes you happy, sure, go ahead. I don't care, but there's no reason to do that. Yeah. If, okay. if you, you wanted to have a policy or if you just wanted to educate the customer, hey, look, if, if you decide down the road you're going to add air conditioning to this, well, I, I did a test on the static pressure, the speed this would run at if it had an air conditioner on it. And guess what? It won't work if you put air conditioning on it. So if you ever think you're going to put air conditioning on it, make sure you get someone who knows what the hell they're doing to test it and make sure they do it right for you. I guess if you wanted to provide that information, you could. But yeah, if it's heating only equipment and there's no AC on it, there is no reason other than for your own information to uh, test static at any speed other than the highest speed it'll run at. Did that answer your question without confusing you too much?
Yes, I believe so. Any other questions? And by the way, I haven't forgotten, I still owe you lunch. Cool. If you're part of Wade, if whoever go back over to me and Dalton will wait. Sorry, did someone have a question? Yeah, wait. Uh, one one more question. Sure. Maybe it'll sound like a real novice on this, but do you have uh, when you're doing that for the static, would you have it on high fire? So you push the let's, test button. Let's, let's say you have a multi-stage or modulating furnace with no air conditioning. Is is that kind of where you're going, Mike? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So you got a modulating furnace with no air conditioning. Um, if I recall, you guys are installing the Coleman. Um, is that right? The Coleman or York uh, yes. modulators? Yes. Okay. So if I remember correctly, they have a button on them called test. And what right. you do is you just hit that test button, and that throws the system into high fire. Okay? Right. right. And in high fire, that is the highest speed that the blower is going to run at. And so that's where you're going to want to do all your testing. Okay. Uh, that's all the HVAC guys know, that's where you do all your gas valve testing. Okay, so that's where you would do your static pressure testing. Throw that guy into high fire, and if I remember correctly on those, it's just that test button. And uh, yeah, and it's the same thing with the two stage. If you had a two stage, just a high and a low fire, you would go into high fire and you would test your static at the highest possible speed that the thing can run at. Okay, that answer your question for you? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Good deal. Anything else anyone wants to go over on static pressure? Okay, well, before I uh, jump off, I would like to just point out, you can call me anytime. You can come up anytime. Um, if I have time, I'll come in the field and help you if you're having static pressure questions, problems, or whatever, okay? Um, also, there's tons of resources on the Internet, like uh, our buddy, uh, Corbett Lunsford, who will actually be at our training palooza in February. Um, he's got some great videos on static pressure. So this is his static pressure testing and mapping demonstration. Watch it right on YouTube. Uh, this is an old time favorite of mine, Bacharach ESP. They've got a two part video on static pressure testing that covers everything we just discussed. Um, and then of course Dwyer um, they're a great resource for static pressure probes and other pressure testing devices. So these are just some tools, if you're not aware of, that you can jump onto, you know, on your phone or whatever, if you're out in the field and go, oh, crap, I forgot which, you know, how do I do this? And uh, as always, feel free to call me anytime you want. Anything else? <clears throat> Okay, I guess I'm done. Who, who's up next? Thanks, Wade. You're welcome. Ming Dalton's up. Just got to click a few things here. Good morning, everybody. We're going to, um, we figured we'd continue on with reviewing a section of the field guide. So we lined it with what we're um, talking about today. And we're going to be in section 8.13.2. Um, we're going to skip down to where it talks about measuring total external static pressure. And I think Wade covered a lot of this really well, but we'll just, I'll just read you out of the, this section out of the field guide for you guys. Um, it says the blower creates the duct pressure that you can measure in inches of water column or pascals. The return static pressure is negative and the supply static pressure is positive. Total external static pressure TESP is the sum of the absolute values of the supply and return static pressures. Absolute value means that you ignore the positive or negative signs when adding the supply static pressure and the return static pressure. Um, this addition represents the distance on a number line as shown in the illustration here. So like in this illustration you got uh, negative 2 
Pascal's on your return and a positive, uh, plot, sorry, positive negative point two and a positive point three, but you just added them together to get a point five. Um, I think Wade kind of covered that really well. Um, it says total external static pressure gives a rough indicator of whether airflow is adequate or not. The greater the TSP, the less airflow. Um, so the higher that number, if you're at like one pass scales, you're not getting as much airflow as if you're at 0.5 um, inches of water column. Um, the greater the total external static pressure, the less the airflow. The supply and return static pressures by themselves can indicate whether the supply or return or both sides are restricted. So whichever side of the system, whether it's your return or your supply, whichever one has the higher number, that's probably where your bigger issues are, your airflow problems. So it can kind of help guide you to which side of the system if you need to address stuff on the return side or the supply side. Um, let's see, it's got an example there. It says, for example, if the supply static pressure is at 0.1 inches of water column or 25 pascals and the return static pressure is at 0.5 inches of water column or 100, sorry, negative 0.5 or negative 125 pascals, you can assume that most of the airflow problems are due to a restricted or undersized return, or it could be the filter. So, um, The test gives a rough estimate. A total external static pressure test gives a rough estimate of airflow if the manufacturer's graph or table for static pressure versus airflow is available. Um, Attach this kind of these steps kind of go through what Wade's kind of already explained, but it says attach two static pressure probes to tubes leading to the two ports of the manometer. Um, so you'd have have it run into the um, input on both sides of your manometer. Attach the high side port to the probe inserted downstream of their handler in the duct supply. The other tube goes upstream of their handler in the return duct. The manometer adds the supply and return static measure to total external static pressure. Um, and it says consult the manufacturer's literature. And Wade, Wade kind of went over that, how each, each furnace manufacturer has um, guidelines on what their system should run under. Um, the standard is kind of 0.5, I think is what the ideal static pressure. Uh, world conditions are 0.5. Yeah, and it can go up with the ECM motors. It can go up to 0.9. Is that right, Wade? It's kind of yeah. I point I always err on the side of caution with ECMs, and I don't like to design anything with an ECM over 0.8. Yes, manufacturers have ECM motors that allow you to go to 0.9. There's even one now that'll go to a full inch water column. But I just err on the side of caution, and uh, that's just me. I've seen enough ECM motors destroyed because they're in systems where the static was over 0.8. So that's where I that's where I stop. Yeah, yeah. So I think that I think that drawing the form that Wade pulled up is a little easier to to read out than this this drawing here. But it's just kind of showing you where um, for total external static pressure. You take a reading on this side of the blower, and on and then on this side of sorry on this side of, of the heat exchangers in between the coil or the coils. So you get your total external static pressure, and then you'd go to the other side of the coil and the other side of the filter to get the drop across to see how much static pressure your filters putting on the system and, and your coil. So I think Wade covered that all well, but. That's that's all I kind of wanted to cover in in the field guide. Does anybody have any questions? I think Matt's got something to add to the auditing side of this. Yeah, just two more minutes of stuff, and then we'll end the meeting. And these guys have already covered everything very well. Uh, just as Wade mentioned, I just wanted to point out these two locations, what that looks like in the audit. So when you're running an audit, 
if you are evaluating the duct leakage using your duct blaster, that's when you'll need those, those two supply and return measurements. So only when you check this box to evaluate duct sealing and then you select you know, your blower door measurements, then you need to have your duct operating pressures in order for the audit to evaluate it properly. And just notice it says supply in Pascal and return in Pascal. So basically all you're going to be doing is grabbing the information. You know, if, if as an auditor, if you'll go into a house and measure those four points, you should have all the information you need to make all these decisions. So the information you gather from uh, location A would go in here on supply and location D would go on the return side. And then there's some guidance. If you hit F1 in the audit, there's some guidance about what numbers you'd put in for after your duct sealing. Uh, typically, you're going to increase by about 5 Pascal because your static pressure will go up when you tighten up your duct. Um, yeah, one thing I just wanted to add. So that was in your audit um, measurement. But remember, auditing C and B, what you need if you're evaluating for a DCM motor. Yeah. So again, the third DC motor. If you're running a good audit, just go collect all four of those data points. And this form, uh, again, we we appreciate when you guys create really useful tools out there in the field. We we grabbed a copy of this and I put this on the uh, the resources page. So if anybody's looking for a copy of that form. It's just on the IWTC resources tab. I put it under auditor's stuff. So under section seven, I think. Yeah, there's the static pressure form. And just a few days ago, I added the one field, which is like the client's uh, name, because the, the copy that was floating around didn't really have anywhere to put the client's name on there. So, but other than that, I think it's a great form. Use it. If you guys have better tools, share them. We love it. But anyway, does anybody have any questions on static pressure or need any further information? Uh, what is, so is that range, if you're determining whether or not you want to put an ECM motor on it, you want to get into that middle range there? <clears throat> so again, my, my threshold, if, if, if I'm considering putting an ECM motor into any system, if that system has got a static pre total static pressure of over 0.8 inches of water column, I'm either going to find a way to fix it or I'm not putting an ECM motor in it because it will burn up the ECM motor. They, they don't like to live in high static situations. Now that being said, there are manufacturers out there with ECM motors that rate them up to a full inch of water column. You know, at the end of the day, the manufacturer's instructions trump everything. But that's, you know, just my my personal humble opinion of over 30 years of experience doing this, sticking ECM motors and systems with static pressure, total static pressure over eight inches of water column is a bad idea, and you're about guaranteed a call back if you do it. Hey, Wade. If if the furnace on the uh, on the plate it says the max total static is like 0.5 or something, is that just for the motor, right? That's in there, or is that for the the furnace itself? So uh, on some furnace nameplates, what what you're seeing there, Tony, is so all this stuff is done in a laboratory. So in a laboratory. They go, okay, this furnace is going to deliver 1,000 CFM at 0.5 static pressure, okay? So they'll put that on the, on the plate that it says optimal airflow or optimal static pressure. They're saying that's the perfect world. That's where they would like to see you or where they would like that system to run at is at 0.5 inches of total static pressure. But every furnace manufacturer book for at least the last 10 years, has in the back of it what they call the fan performance curve. And that tells you the range of static pressure that that blower can operate in. So you may see a furnace on the nameplate where it says 
total static pressure 0.5, that's optimal. That's like they're saying, okay, under perfect conditions in the laboratory, this is where it would be. But every one of them has a range, and that range for every manufacturer I'm aware of is from 0.1 to 0.9, and there's a couple that have gone up to a full one inch of water column. So did that answer your question? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. All right, anything else? Okay, let's go ahead and end. Thank you guys for uh, your participation, and have a great day. Thank you.